Hi everyone, I hope this finds you in good health and good spirits. So this is our first video lecture. I'll likely post two of these a week, probably on Mondays and Wednesdays of each week. And these are going to cover some basic synthesis concepts and history where relevant, and will also serve as tutorials on how to use some of the software that we're going to be using on this second half of the semester. So as you probably know, after the midterm now, we're going to be transitioning to focusing on modular synthesis. And this is going to uh, build on what we've done already with our hardware synthesizers with the MS-20s, but also expand into other types of synthesis in a really interesting way. So I'm pretty excited about it, and I hope that despite the dire situation that we find ourselves in, uh, this can be something that you get a lot out of and find some enjoyment in. So uh, you may remember that earlier in the semester we looked at some modular synth videos, and let's go ahead and take a look at one again to help us get started. Okay, so what we're going to be focusing on today, we're going to talk about modular synthesis. We're going to go over just the basic concept of what modular synthesis is. We're going to talk about Don Buchla and the Buchla instruments, and then we'll talk about Eurorack modules. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about control voltage, though that's a subject that we'll come back to pretty frequently. And we'll wrap up by going over some basic techniques and helping you get started in VCV rack. So modular synthesis is a method of sound synthesis in which larger systems or larger instruments are composed of individual separate modules, each of which performs a unique function. And we've talked about this a bit already. On the slide there, you can see the Moog modular synthesizer, and it's built up of each of these individual separate modules. You can see them on the instrument there. They're all separated by those silver vertical lines. So each of these modules were independent components that would have to be connected to one another using patch cords. So what's tough about modular synthesis is that you do have to connect every individual module to one another, and very often you're not able to save presets or anything like that. Um, but what's great about modular synthesis is it allows the user total freedom to construct all sorts of unique signal paths. So we're not bound by the same signal path with every patch, starting with the VCOs, moving through the filter, moving through the amplifier. We've got a lot more flexibility and can design our own instruments. So the key idea I want you to take away from today about modular synthesis is that in modular synthesis, all modules are voltage controlled. That is, they all speak the same language, whether they're oscillators or LFOs or filters or sequencers, they all are voltage controlled and they all speak the same language of voltage, which means that any parameter on any module can be controlled by the output of any other module. So this allows a near infinite variety of patches and resulting sounds. So for example, we could patch an LFO so that it controls the pitch of a VCO. We're kind of familiar with that from the MS-20. But then we could do things that we weren't able to do on the MS-20. We could use a VCO to modulate the resonance of our filter. Or we could use a random voltage from sample and hold to vary the release time of an envelope generator. So we have a lot more possibilities, um, but we can always use the output of one module to control some sort of parameter on another module. Now modular synthesis as it's practiced today kind of has its roots with Don Buchla and the Buchla synthesizer. So Don Buchla was a student of physics and physiology and music at UC Berkeley in the early 1960s. And he developed his own voltage-controlled modular synthesizer around the exact same time, but totally independent of Robert Moog. So whereas Robert Moog was working in New York, developing the Moog modular synthesizer in the 1960s, 
John Buchlow was developing his own voltage-controlled modular synthesizer on the West Coast around the same time. And they didn't have any communication with one another. They were doing this totally independently. So Buchla collaborated with experimental composers at a place called the San Francisco Tate Music Center. And he was working with composers like Morton Subotnik and Ramon Sender. And these two composers wanted an instrument that could create electronic music without the hassle of splicing tape. They were doing a lot of tape music, as you can see by the name of their facility there, the San Francisco Tape Music Center. So they were really interested in electronic music, but they found the cumbersome process of cutting tape and recording on the tape and splicing tape together to be kind of tedious. So they were looking for some alternative strategies and tapped Buchla to help them build an electronic instrument. And he did, and a lot of the composers at the Tape Music Center started working on this instrument. Uh, Morton Subotnik recorded a really important piece of music we'll look at next week called Silver Apples of the Moon. And if you're familiar with the composer Pauline Oliveros, who's one of my favorites, a lot of her early electronic music was recorded on the Buchla synthesizers. Buchla's first instrument was called the Buchla 100 Music Box. Um, this was a synthesizer designed by Buchla with some input from Subotnik and some of his other, uh, some of the other composers he was working with. It was a voltage-controlled modular synth, and you can see on the slide there, it's got all these independent modules, which are all connected via patch cords. Um, so it contained all these separate modules, but the patch cords that he was using were kind of interesting. Uh, he used regular phono plugs for signal voltages. These are like your regular TS cables uh, that you would use to connect a guitar to a guitar amp. But for control voltages, he used banana plugs, which looked like this. And what's cool about the banana plugs is you could daisy chain them together and have one plugged into another so that you could actually send multiple control voltages to a single module. So for instance, imagine on the MS-20, if you wanted the control wheel to change your pitch, but you also wanted to have some random pitch changes through sample and hold, on the MS-20, we would have to make a decision. Do you want one or the other? But with the banana plugs, we could actually plug both of them into the VCOs and have both of them controlling simultaneously. Actually, now that I think about it, we could pull that off on the MS-20. We could plug the wheel into total and the sample and hold into the frequency of the oscillators. But you take my point. Two would be the limit on the MS-20, whereas on the Buchla, we could stack four, five, six, seven control voltages into the same jack. Another thing that set the Buchla instruments apart was that they lacked a piano keyboard. Buchla and the composers that he was working with were really interested in new sounds and new strategies for working with music and composing. And so it was anathema to them to take something as traditional as a piano keyboard, which would bind their pitches to the 12 chromatic pitches of the Western scale, when they were far more interested in finding new ways of working with sound. So they did not build a piano keyboard, but Buchla did build some unique controllers, including this one, which he called a tactile sensor panel, which is not laid out like a traditional keyboard, but that does give a player uh, manual control over different parameters on the instrument. But what's perhaps even more significant is that Buchla introduced the first sequencer on his synthesizers. We're going to spend a little more time on sequencers here in a couple weeks, but what a sequencer was, was a way of recording and storing a series of voltages that would repeat in a pattern. And then these voltages could be sent to a VCO to produce a series of pitches, or to the filter to produce different filter positions. They could be sent anywhere on the instrument, um, but they were used to be able to program these sequences in, which then would allow the instrument to play on its own while the performer could move to different aspects and change different parameters. Buchla continued working on his instruments, and in 1969, he introduced the Buchla System 200, which introduced this arched boat design, as they call it, in which all the components are laid out and are more easily accessible than they were in the music box. And in the System 200, Buchla introduced a lot more new modules, and a lot of them had very characteristically Buchla strange names. So, uh white noise and other randomized control voltages didn't come from a noise generator or a sample and hold unit or a random unit. They came from the source of uncertainty. And you might have uh, other advanced controls from a module like the one pictured on the right called the arbitrary function generator, which is effectively just a sequencer that introduces some aspects of randomness, but it's way cooler just to call it the arbitrary function generator. 
So one artist who was really taken with the Buchla synthesizer early on and who continued using it all throughout her career is Suzanne Chani. So let's go ahead and take a look at a video of her improvising with the Buchla. And you can see how the machine was used and how a really experienced performer like Chani might use it to improvise. So I'll post a link to the full video there in the description of the video so you guys can take a look at that in more context. So I mentioned some of the ways in which Buchla's approach was very different from Robert Moog's, and we can actually look at this a little more closely and come up with two very different practices or philosophies towards sound synthesis, an East Coast philosophy and a West Coast philosophy. So on the East Coast, Robert Moog, based in New York, uh, Moog's approach really emphasized ease of use. So he was all about creating instruments that would be very easy for musicians who already had experience in other types of music, whether that's classical music or pop music or whatever, to adapt to these new instruments and start making music they were already accustomed to making with these new sounds. And this is most apparent in his introduction of the keyboard controller. Moog's synthesizer was the first to introduce a keyboard controller. And so Moog's instrument really appealed to performers uh, who were interested in new timbres. So we can hear things like this in Wendy Carlos's Switched on Bach, where she's taking uh, really traditional music, music that at that point was, you know, 200 years old, um, and then performing it with this new instrument and emphasizing these new timbres. Buchla on the West Coast, however, he and his colleagues emphasize experimentation. So they're not utilizing keyboard controllers, they're using new controllers, they're developing things like sequencers that are taking music in new directions. And so while Moog is appealing to performers, Buchla is appealing to composers and experimental musicians who are interested in these new ways of creating music. But even deeper than these broad philosophies about experimentation versus ease of use, we can actually look at the individual components and how they were used and see some of these uh, philosophies manifesting in a more technical sense. 
So we're pretty familiar with the East Coast design of using standard VCO waveforms like sawtooth waves, square waves, etc., and then running them through a VCF, through a filter, and doing what we all know as subtractive synthesis, and then controlling an amplifier with a four-stage ADSR envelope, which is used to imitate the envelopes of lots of acoustic instruments. Um, however, the West Coast philosophy, um, while they might use some sawtooth and square waves and run them through filters and things like that, what was more common was the use of wave shapers of VCOs. And these would be modules that would take a fairly standard wave, like a sine wave or a triangle wave, perform some mathematical operations on them to vary the shape of that wave and to create some strange, unconventional sounding timbres as a result. Here's an example. In addition, they use what were called low-pass gates. And a low-pass gate is kind of a combination of a filter and an amplifier together in the same module. So it's an amplifier that would open with every attack from, say, a sequencer. And really, the sequencer is kind of driving a lot of the different types of modules that they're choosing. So in addition, on the Buchla, you might be more likely to see a two-stage AD or AR envelope. That's an envelope that just has an attack and a decay or an attack and a release. Um, so rather than having an envelope that's able to sustain for a long time, if you think about you're working with a sequencer which is playing quick notes in these looping successions, you don't necessarily need something that's going to have a long sustain, you just want something that's going to have more of a percussive attack with just an attack time and a release time. So time permitting, we'll look at wave shaping and low pass gates in a little more detail uh, later on. We'll definitely look at some two stage envelopes, uh, some ADAR envelopes when we look at drum synthesis here in a couple weeks. Okay, so now let's talk about Eurorack. So Eurorack is a hardware modular synthesizer format that was developed by a German company, Dopfer Musik Elektronik, in 1996. So essentially, it's a hardware specification that lots of different companies can use to make synthesizer modules, hardware synthesizer modules, that will play nicely with each other. So it's become the most widely used format for a number of big manufacturers like Moog and Roland. They both make uh, Eurorack modules, but also a lot of DIY module designers. So you'll have just people who like to tinker around and build their own modules or really small boutique companies that might just manufacture one or two different modules, uh, they can use the same specifications. And so you have a really, really wide variety of all kinds of different modules made by companies big and small that all speak the same language and are able to talk to each other. So we'll look real quickly at some of the Eurorack specifications. Uh, they use a 3.5 millimeter mono jack for all patch cables. That's essentially a headphone size jack, except whereas headphones are stereo, these would just be mono cables. Essentially, it's the exact same as the MS-20 patch cables. All the modules are the same height. It's three U's or three height units. It's about uh, 133 millimeters or about five inches. So all those modules are the same. You can see the picture there on the slide. Uh, all those modules there on that Eurorack synthesizer are all the same height. Now their widths might vary, but their widths are all measured in the same uh, unit, which are called HPs or horizontal pitch unit, which makes them very easy to mount to a rack. All the audio signals typically stay within the range of negative 5 volts to positive 5 volts, and they all use the volts per octave method of pitch control, which is a way of specifying how voltage will be converted into specific pitches. We're going to go into that in a lot more detail in the next lesson. But for now, let's go ahead and take a look at another video using a Eurorack modular synthesizer comprised of components from a number of different manufacturers.
So control voltage is a really important idea that we're going to be coming back to and back to again and again. But I just want to give some introductory information on the topic for today. So remember, all modules in modular synthesis are voltage controlled. They all speak that same electronic language. And so a control voltage is simply any voltage that's used to control different modules uh, or specific parameters of those modules, like the pitch of a VCO or the cutoff frequency of a filter. And control voltage is what travels across a patch cord from one module to another. Now there are four types of control voltage, and as we'll see as we start working, there's not hard barriers between these categories. They all travel along the same patch cords, and they're all voltage, so it's not like they're speaking different languages. But there are essentially four different things that we'll be doing with voltage, and uh, we can kind of group them into these broad categories. So first, there's audio. Now, audio signals are used to send things that we're going to hear. So for instance, the output of a VCO is something that we're going to hear. That's an audio signal. We might move that audio signal through a filter and eventually out the amplifier. Uh, so an audio signal is going to carry anything that we are intending to listen to as audio. Then there's volts per octave voltages. Now remember, volts per octave voltages are voltages that are going to be sent to an oscillator to tell that oscillator what pitch to play. So if we're taking a voltage from a keyboard controller uh, and sending that to an oscillator that's going to tell that oscillator which key is being pressed on a keyboard and therefore which pitch to play, that's going to be a volts per octave voltage. Third is modulation. And this is going to be any voltage that's used to modulate or change or control a parameter of some module. So uh, for instance, if we send an LFO uh, to give some vibrato to a signal on an oscillator, that's modulating. That's adding some frequency modulation, and it's changing that parameter, the pitch in this case, of that oscillator. And our last is kind of a group of three different control voltages, gates, triggers, and clocks. And these are all voltages that are used to start events of some kind. So you may remember on the MS-20, whenever we pressed a key, that key would tell the oscillators which pitch to play, but it would also start what we called a trigger signal, which it sent to the envelopes and told the envelopes when to start the attack, how long to sustain, and then when it ended, when to start the release. Now this may be a little confusing, but we're going to use some different language in the modular synthesis world. So what we call the trigger signal on the MS-20, in the modular synth world they call gates. And gates have duration. So gates are most commonly used to start or end envelopes, to start ADSR envelopes. So when I say they have duration, I mean they measure time. When you press a key on a MIDI controller and you hold that key down, you start the gate and that gate continues until you take your finger off the key and then that gate ends. So we use that for envelopes where there's going to be lots of sustain. Then we have things that are called triggers, and these are different than the trigger signals that we use on the MS-20 because triggers here have no duration. They're essentially like uh, a way to tell a module go. It's kind of like when you're having a race and there's that referee guy who like shoots a gun in the air and that tells all the runners to start running. A trigger is like shooting the gun in the air. It tells a module, go, start. But it doesn't have a duration. In actual practice, it does have a duration. Effectively, a trigger is a one millisecond burst of voltage that just goes from zero to, I think it's 10 volts, and then after one millisecond drops right back down. But we use triggers to trigger instantaneous events. So for instance, we might use a trigger on one of those West Coast style attack decay envelopes that don't have a duration, they don't need a sustain, so you just need to trigger that envelope to start and then you're already done with it. And then lastly, there are clocks. And clocks are modules that produce a regular steady sequence of gates or triggers, where we just have a regular steady stream of gates to start envelopes uh, or triggers to start other events. And this is essentially what we have in sequencers. Sequencers produce a steady stream of these gates, so we can, for instance, tell an amplifier to play a series of notes. This might seem a little confusing now, but once we get into working with VCV rack and doing some modular synthesis, you'll get a good sense of how these uh, different types of control voltage work. Now I labeled these in four different colors, red, yellow, green, and blue, and I did that for a specific reason. There's a YouTuber named Omri Cohen who makes a lot of VCV rack videos, and 
I'll be sharing some of those with you because I think they're really instructive and quite helpful. Um, and I've watched a number of them myself. And one practice that he has is that he uses different color patch cords in his VCV rack patches for each of these different types of control voltage. And that's a practice that I'm going to adopt in my videos and then I'm going to ask you guys to do on your projects and assignments. And there are two reasons for this. Number one, I think it's really instructive. It helps you get a sense of the different types of voltages and what you're actually doing in your patch. But then number two, it also makes your patches really easy to understand. Because if you get used to this color association, when you look at a patch, you can immediately tell what's going on in a way that might be a little more difficult if your patch cords were all just assigned random colors. All right, so let's start talking about VCV Rack. VCV Rack is going to be our primary software for the rest of the semester. It's a free open source application that emulates Eurorack style modular synthesis. So it has all these uh, virtual modules that we can connect with patch cords and create our own patches. And it allows users to access a small group of core modules that come with the program as well as numerous third-party modules, uh, which are made from a whole bunch of different manufacturers, just like real Eurorack modules. Some of them are made by big manufacturers. Others are made by DIY programmers who just wanted to write a synthesizer module. Some of these actually emulate real physical Eurorack modules made by big manufacturers. So on the slide there, you can see a hardware module made by Mutable Instruments and its VCV rack equivalent. Um, but then, as I said, a lot of others are just programmed by DIY folks who just want to create their own modules. Okay, so here we are in the default patch of VCV Rack, and I want to just go over a couple quick things to help us get started. First, we want to choose our audio output. So I'm going to look over here at this audio module, and you can see down here it says no device. So we want to choose our audio driver and our device right here. So I'm going to leave my audio driver on core audio on the Mac. And now I'm going to choose my device. The device is what I want the sound to actually come out of. So you can see here I can choose the built-in output of my computer, the built-in speakers. I can choose here uh, Focus, uh, Focusrite Scarlet, which is my audio interface. Or I can go down and choose from Soundflower, which is an audio routing app. Uh, which is actually what I'm going to do because I'm, that's going to be helpful for me recording this video. It might look slightly different on your computer depending on if you have a Mac or a PC. And then this is our default patch. It should look exactly the same on your computer except I've gone and recolored the patch cords based on the schema that we were talking about a second ago. So the next thing that I want to do is set up my MIDI control voltage here. And right now, by default, it's using the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, so that is your actual computer keyboard. So as you type different keys on the keyboard, you, you can send different voltages, different pitches to your oscillator. And you'll also trigger the gate of the ADSR envelope, which you can see here. So this MIDI control voltage module is sending volts per octave information to the oscillator. And it's also sending a, a gate to the ADSR uh, envelope generator. So you can see on the slide here how the QWERTY keyboard is set up, how the bottom row of keys produces the white keys on the keyboard and the middle, the second from the bottom produces the black keys. Uh, then the next two rows do the same thing. And then in the top left, the uh, tilde key and the one key will change the octaves that you're able to produce. So you can, even if you don't have a MIDI controller at home, you can use the computer keyboard to play pitches in VCV rack. But let's say you do have a MIDI controller and you want to change that. So I'm going to go up here to where it says computer keyboard, and I'm going to change that to core MIDI. And then I'm going to go down here to device and see if I can find my MIDI controller. And sure enough, there's uh, two ports there, SL Mark II port one and two. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. And now when I play the keys on my MIDI controller, uh, my MIDI controller is controlling the pitches that the, are produced by the VCO and the gate of my envelope instead of my QWERTY keyboard. 
And let's look at some of the other sends here, just in case you guys have MIDI controllers at home you want to work with. The most essential that you want to work with are the volts per octave send, which will go to your oscillator, and then the gate, which will go to your ADSR envelope generator. Uh, in addition, you could send velocity from, uh, which is how hard you strike the key if you want that to control something. Uh, then there's aftertouch, which is how hard you press the keys after you've already pressed them. PW here stands for pitch wheel. So if your MIDI controller has a pitch wheel, that information is going to come be converted into voltage and come out right here. And then modulation wheel will come out here under MW. And then there's a few other controls here, including a re-trigger for when you hit a key twice in quick succession. Uh, but these are the most important here that we're going to be working with the most. So let me go through just a couple quick things uh, with regard to moving around in the software and uh, doing different things with the modules. So first, let's say we want to add a module. You're going to right-click the empty space, and this will pull up the uh, module library, as it were. And you can scroll through. There's uh, first different types of modules. You'll see here envelope generator, uh, low pass gate, etc. And then down here are different brands or different manufacturers. And you can filter them using different combinations of these uh, filters. So I'm just going to go down to the core modules. And I'm going to grab uh, another oscillator. And I'll put that right there, and I can go ahead and connect it to something if I wanted to. So you can see that just by clicking a module and dragging, we can move it around. And if we wanted to uh, move several modules, we can command click, hold the command or control if you're on a PC, uh, and click and drag, and that'll move several modules around. And we can move them around like that to make room for things and insert things where we want them. If I want to delete a module, I can just click it and then hit the backspace key and that will delete it. And I can also right click a module for some additional commands, like if I wanted to initialize it, that's reset it to its defaults, disconnect all the cables from it, etc. Uh, some modules, especially third party modules, but even some of the core modules like this MIDI CV, if you right click on it, you can go down and find a few additional parameters that you can't get to from just the knobs on the main interface there. And then lastly, uh, we can hit the command or control key and zoom in and out with uh, the mouse wheel if we want to get a bird's eye view or look in more closely at a module. And so I've listed those commands here on the slide in case you need them for reference. Now let's look at changing parameters on a module. Um, I'm just going to go over these quickly. Uh, you can obviously click and drag a knob to change that parameter. Uh, and if you control click or command click on a Mac and drag, you can fine tune that knob and it'll move uh, more subtly and in smaller intervals. And after you've moved a knob, say you want to reset it to its default, you can just double click it and it'll move back to its default position. And if you want to type in a specific value of a knob, let's say I want to set my oscillator here to a base frequency of 440 hertz, I can right click it. And this opens a space where I can go ahead and just type in whatever value I want, hit enter, and it'll be set there. Uh, I can do the same thing with the uh, cutoff frequency of my filter. I could set that to, I don't know, 2000 hertz, and it'll go there where I want it to. Lastly, you can see that whenever I hover over some of these knobs, uh, a little box comes up showing me what the value of that particular knob is. That's not a default setting. So if you want to get that, you're going to have to go up to View and then check Parameter Tooltips. And that will allow you to see what the value of a knob is whenever you hover over it. OK, and then lastly, let's quickly talk about patch cords. Obviously, if you want to draw a patch cord in or connect a module, you're going to uh, just click on the outlet and then drag it over to whatever inlet you want to send it to. Uh, if you want to send an outlet to more than one inlet, you can command or control click, and that will generate additional patch cords that you can then drag around to different positions. If you want to get a different color patch cord, which is definitely something we're going to want to do since we're going to use different patch cords for different types of control voltages, 
then you can uh, just click multiple times uh, to cycle through the different colors. So let's say I want a green cable here. Oh, got it first time, but let's say I didn't. Uh, red, blue, yellow. Okay, there's green, and then you can connect it. And they always cycle through in the same order. So one thing to note about VCV rack is that it won't let you plug inlets into outlets. It'll only let you plug outlets into inlets. So that means your signal flow is always going to work correctly. You can't accidentally plug something into something that it won't work with. So for instance, you can see whenever I click this one, a lot of the outlets are all grayed out and it won't let me plug into it, but the inlets are all still available for me to connect it to. So the next thing we should talk about are plugins. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of third plug there's a lot of third-party plugins, and we'll definitely want to use some of those for our class. So in order to get plugins, I know one of the other tutorial videos I gave you guys goes over this, but it looks a little different now, so I figured I'd go over it quickly myself. So first, make sure you've created an account and are logged in to VCV Rack, both in the app here and then also on the website itself. So then you're going to go up to Library and Manage Plugins, and this pulls up the VCV Rack library. And then you can search for uh, plugins by just a keyword, or you can filter them by brand or by tag. So um, there are some different brands that I'm going to ask you guys to subscribe to that are produce a lot of free plugins. Uh, so one of them is Bog Audio. So just to walk you guys through that, I'm going to uh, subscribe. I'm going to search for Bog Audio here. And that when I do that, all the Bog Audio plugins come up here. And then all I have to do then is just find any one of them where it says subscribe to Bog Audio. And I'm going to click on that. And now I, because I'm already logged in, am now subscribed to Bog Audio. So I can just uh, minimize this, go back to VCV Rack. And then all I want to do is quit. And then I'm going to reopen. And then now you can see my library icon has a little red uh, notification by it. When I click in there, it says uh, there's an update. I can download the Bog Audio plugins. I'm going to click on that, let them download. And they're not going to be in my uh, plugin library here just yet. So I'm going to have to quit one more time and then restart rack. And then now when I right click and look in there, sure enough, there's the Bog Audio plugins. Now there are six plugin brands that I'd like you guys to subscribe to. Number one is Bog Audio, which I just used as my example there. Bog Audio has tons of great modules, including a spectral analyzer and some additive and FM synthesis modules that I'm going to use in my tutorials uh, and that we're going to look at in more detail in our class later on. Then there's, I'm not sure how to say this, uh, New York Sithi or N-Y-S-T-H-I. Uh, they've got a multi-track recording module that's going to be really necessary for us to do our projects with. So I'll ask you guys to subscribe to that. Then there's JW Modules, which has a handy clock and a nice quantizer. Bafaco, which has a handy spring reverb, as well as some other modules that are pretty instructive and we might use for some examples. Uh, Volt has a lot of useful modules for drum synthesis. Uh, there's one picture there on the slide there on the right, a drum envelope. So we'll definitely look at Volt later in the class. And then Audible Instruments, which just has a ton of uh, high quality physical modeling and random sequencing modules, all which are based on actual hardware synthesizer modules. So those are some great ones there. In addition, I'm not going to require you guys to download these ones, but there are a few other plugin uh, brands I'd recommend subscribing to. Modular Fungi is really just a bunch of decorative plates that don't do anything, but they've got a handy plate with the Omri Cohen uh, color scheme uh, picture there on the slides. So if you want to subscribe to that so you can add that plate to your patches so you don't have to memorize or have to keep looking up what the color scheme is supposed to be, um, that could be handy for you. ML Modules has a voltmeter, which Omri Cohen uses in some of his videos. I may end up using in mine. They've also got a handy quantizer. Valley has a nice plate reverb, pictured there on the bottom right of the slide, and also a useful random sequencer for drum programming. And then MSM has some instructive wave shaping and wave folding modules, uh, which we might look at if we have time to get to some West Coast synthesis stuff, uh, or if you're interested in investigating that on your own, uh, that those could be cool to check out. So those four are not super required, but might be useful for you. Okay, so a couple of things before we wrap up. I want to show you guys how to do an audio input and then how to save and export a patch. So 
In addition to sending audio out from VCV Rack, we can also bring audio in in case you wanted to, say, run a guitar through a module or some other instrument or something. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and add another one of these audio modules. I'll drag that over here. And I'm going to set this device to my audio interface, the input. And then down here where it says from device, I can send the incoming audio from my, in this case, audio interface to the different modules in BCV Rack. So I'm going to grab an audio cable here, send that to this mixer here, and we'll grab another one, red for audio, send it to our scope here. And so now as I speak, the audio that I'm speaking is coming into VCV Rack, and then I could process that or modulate it or do whatever I wanted with it. In addition, we can uh, save our patches when we're done and open them just like in any program. So if I wanted to save this, I go down to Save or Save As. Uh, give it a name, Lesson 1 and then open that later. And those VCV Rack patch files are really, really small. So it's very easy to upload them to the Blackboard discussion board if you have a question with something. Uh, this is also how you'll submit your assignments. So uh, make sure you're able to save those projects and find them when you save them. Um, what One thing that I have done is I've created a patch where I just deleted everything because I like to start from scratch and not the default patch. So I can always just go to open. Uh, open the patch that I've named blank, and that gives me nothing. So that might be something you guys might want to look into doing is delete everything out, save it as blank so that you can start from scratch whenever you want. In addition to saving and uploading VCV rack patches, you might find it useful to just take screenshots sometimes. So if you have a question you want to post to the discussion board, just take a screenshot. I'll put a link in the uh, PowerPoint slides, uh, helping you know, figure out how to do that if you don't know how to do that on your machine. Um, but it might be helpful to upload a screenshot if you're having a particular trouble. But honestly, those VCB rack patches are so small, it'd be no problem just to save what you're working on and just upload those to the discussion board or send them in an email or whatever. Okay, so last thing I wanna do is show you a patch that I made in VCV Rack this week uh, as I was finding my way around in the software, uh, just to show you some of the things that are possible. So this patch randomly produces a slow, quasi-ambient pattern of notes from a specific scale with a constantly changing attack and filter cutoff. And in addition, there's a randomly changing bass line playing the same scale, uh, but with a constantly, very subtly varying rhythm. So I don't have to play this patch at all, it just plays itself. And there's lots of visual displays to show me what's going on, which I always find really helpful. So I just leave that to show you the kinds of things that are possible. You guys should be able to build something like this in no time. So to wrap up, in this lesson we talked about modular synthesis, we talked about the basic concept of modular synthesis, looked at Don Buchla and his instruments, uh, and then talked about Eurorack modular synthesis. We talked about some of the different types of control voltage, and then we did some basic things to help us get started in VCV Rack. Uh, we looked at the audio and MIDI setup, some of the basic controls, looked at subscribing to plugins, and then also saving our projects. Uh, if you have more questions about VCV Rack, be sure to look at some of the other videos that I've added in the lesson folder, which go through some of those things in more detail. Other than that, keep exploring VCV Rack, and I'll post another lesson later this week.